Arsenal come streaming forward now in surely what will be their last attack. A good ball by Dixon, finding Smith. But Thomas charging through the midfield. Thomas, it's up for grabs now. Thomas, right at the end. Hello and welcome to Gooners in the USA podcast. Mike! Andy, 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 Andy. How where are, are you? you? Where are you at the moment? I am in Portsmouth, England, United Kingdom, capital of the world. <laughs> Portsmouth is the capital of the well, world. Well, I was going to say United where, Kingdom was, but um, I'm actually... Where's your accent? I told you it doesn't really come back that much. That much. It, should, it, it needs to come back. I mean, your, your accent may not come back, but... About five minutes before we started uh, taping this, I got a, a, a in the WhatsApp group. I get I get having some tea. Give me five minutes. So uh, you're you're clearly British AF at this point. Well, yeah. I mean, I always drink tea. Everyone, anyone who knows me knows I drink tea. But yes, um, yeah. So no accent that really comes back. But um, still drinking tea. And it was a beautiful day today, actually, here in England. It's been rainy since I've been home, but uh, today's been beautiful. So. <laughs> Can't complain. With you, but uh, so 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 tell us about your trip. I mean, I've been sitting in the fetal position here, just jealous and 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 wishing I was over there with you. But uh, how how was your Friday? I you know I, obviously you and I had talked, and so I'll echo to uh, the listeners um, what I echoed to you when I called you. I, I was very humbled by how amazing. Some of the people that we've uh, we've met throughout this podcast, and so I'm talking about like Tom Canton, uh, Lee Judges. I met Ola, Amanda, uh, Bobby. I mean, just amazing people. So ba- basically, met them oh, at Andy. Uh, uh, oh yeah, Andy, and I'll get to Andy because man, he got me drunk. But um, <laughs> we went to the Tollington for about four o'clock. Uh, I took my cousin Sam, who's an Evertonian, and he wants to come on the pod after we play Everton. But uh, met them at the Tollington, um, went and picked up, uh, had a couple drinks, went and picked up our tickets from the Emirates. And Mike, I had a heart attack moment because I show up, um, give him my ID, and uh, there's no tickets. <laughs> and like literally, like like my like just, I felt like I was gonna hurl. <laughs> and and then so I showed the guy the email from Arsenal America, which says, you know, how to go get your tickets and sees it's the last game. He says, all right, I'll be right back. He comes back five minutes later with an envelope in his hand. He goes, they just brought these up. And uh, I wish I could say I had something to do with that. Just to, just oh, to take the man. Or something like that. I was but... like thinking, how do I call Adrian? How do I call Adrian? Um, <laughs> and so, so got, pick up the tickets. <laughs> We picked up the tickets, and so then we went to Pieberry, where I met up with Lee. I uh, got to finally meet Bobby, which uh, I'll get into that in a little second. So um, going to Pieberry, where I've never been before, it's packed. There's a DJ outside playing ska music, which I thought was hilarious. So wasn't of, that wasn't that Paul? I mean, the DJ. No, Paul. Times is the owner of. The, yeah, of no, the... Paul was kind of going around because he. Uh, it was funny. He tried to move me. He's like, "You can't stand there," and I apologized. And then Don't he you know who I am. No, no. And then he then he saw me with the crew, and I think he put two and two together. But he was figuring shit out, so he he left, and so I didn't really get to talk to him. But what was really funny was um, I've never been to Pyberry before, and so I had the venison with a red wine reduction. Can you? That would be Thierry Henry. I was gonna say, can you guess? So uh, classy. I've put him in my mouth many times. Yep, classy. And then um, we kind of went from there and. and did another pub at the Met. Um, it was a student pub, fancy again. And then we walked over to the to the stadium and um, kind of split up because uh, we all had different seats. And then after the match, we met at Tony Adams' um, statue. We were gonna go and watch Arsenal Fan TV record because I was just curious at how crazy it was. And we've had Rob on the show, and. Uh, they were like there were probably like three hundred people watching them record. Oh, it's it's absolutely not. I yeah. mean, I'm sure Lee waited through all that to get his. He spot, yeah, he got on and then um, and then we went you got down. To see celebrity Lee. Yeah. Oh oh, talk about celebrity Lee. He went and filmed <laughs> for the BBC before the match, so he didn't really spend much time with us before. Um, 
But uh, so then we went from there to 12 pins, and that's where Andy got me uh, pretty drunk. He would not let me buy him a drink, so uh, whenever he gets to America, the drinks are on me. But I will say, Mike, I've met a lot of people who listen to our podcast who I've never met before, and they just said such wonderful things. And I know that we've built these relationships around meeting some of these people online. And I, I truly like say to anyone heading over to England, reach out to some of these people because they will take you out for a great night and they will treat you like family. And, and I can't like stress enough you know, meeting Amanda for the first time because I'd never really talked to her before. She's going to be on the pod in a couple weeks, but... She was yeah, just I've so been pretty much hogging her for myself. But, I know, but uh, she's so lovely. And then um, Andy is a new listener of ours, and he was, you know, he was just absolutely epic. Just, a, just we share the same hatred for Theo, so we bond over that. But these people <laughs> are just amazing. And then, you know, I, I know Claude gets a lot of stick um, on Arsenal fan TV and Twitter, but I didn't really talk to him much. But we conversed a little bit, and he was very genuine. And, and these people were just really, really good people. And um, yeah, it was epic. And then the match, oh boy, what yeah. a game! Well, I, before before we go too much, I mean, yeah. I, I, we'll talk about your experience at the match. But what does the Friday night element? I love Friday night games uh, personally. The, now that we had one. There was a great vibe around. So I would say the Emirates really picked up around five o'clock. So clearly, when when off work traffic, but a lot of people commented after they loved the fact that it was Friday night because they could stay out. They could enjoy themselves. There wasn't a rush to get home. Obviously, in London, and funny story with Ola, but the, you, you know trains end at some point. So uh, poor Ola missed his train and had to crash where where I was staying. Um, but the the vibe on a Friday, I think, was really good. Um, and then it was also really unique, Mike, because I've been to the Emirates a couple times where there's been a very heavy police presence. But this was one of those games where Leicester fans. And Arsenal fans were interacting. A lot of people were walking around together. There was no issue. It just looked like people were excited the season was back. Obviously, there's no big rivalry. Um, but there was no issues. Um, you know, there was still some banter, but that was about it. But um, good, good vibe. Oh, it was a great, great vibe. It, I think everyone was just like excited to just see football, you know, and, and not have it be preseason. So. Well, and, and and football they saw <laughs> oh. that game. I, I cannot believe that that's the game you got to see. That that's crazy. You know, I got a text from some friends in America that said, "Well, you know, after the match, he said, well, that was better than a two nil win.'" And I thought it was, but and we'll get into <laughs> it. We're papering over cracks at this point. That's the key. We'll get that, into that's it. the key. That's <clears> the key. That's the key. After the game, immediately after the game, I tweeted something about how like Arsenal Twitter and Arsenal, you know, the Arsenal media everywhere was going to be that 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 phrase was going to be used constantly, the papering over the cracks thing, and um, and and of course it was. Uh, our defense was an enormous gaping, stinky crack. I mean, and, and I'm not sure you could completely pape over what our defense was. No, and and I put on Twitter like you know. What do you expect when you have a 20-year-old center back who, who, let's be honest, the bulk of his career has been a Bolton at Bolton, and then you've got two left back or left wing backs playing next to him? I mean, you're going to look bad. And specifically, you're going to look bad against a team like Leicester who ran the ball down your throat. I mean, they're a great counter-attacking team. And... Um, you know, you're never going to go into a, a team like Chelsea or United and, and, and win a game with those three in your back. And Leicester's kind of probably on that very short list of other teams that can cause you that trouble. And so there's no surprise we looked shaky. Um, but for me, Mike, and I don't know how you feel about this, if Mustafi is healthy enough to, to be on the bench... He should be able to play in the match because Tom and I were talking about that as we were walking in. If you five minutes into the game and Holding goes down with a hammy, who's coming in? Yeah, there's no, there's yeah. no like. Well, hold on a second. Let's put El Nini back there until the 60th minute. You're bringing bringing on Mustafi, right? So if you're on the bench, you should play. Um, that would have probably helped shore up a little bit, but. To be honest, the defense were at fault for some of the goals, but we had bigger issues with Chak. We had bigger issues giving the ball away. We just didn't play well. 
you know. Yeah, and, and we'll talk about them, but it did yeah. kind of feel like a little deja vu from last year's first game with the with the you know the the leaky defense and and you know <laughs> but but a different result a different four three this time. Um, so I'm assuming you were sitting clock end upper. Is that so we were clock end or- upper, um, just just above the Leicester City supporters. Uh, we got really lucky, right. and we had the that- we had the row with the bar right in front of us. There were some other Yankee uh, fans kind of milling about, um, and yeah, that and- tends to be the Arsenal America kind yeah. of block. And, and I will yeah. echo again: if you are a supporter from America. And you truly want to go and see Arsenal play, and you're heading to England. Join Arsenal America, and you'll get tickets if you ask far enough in advance. Um, yeah. And it's such a great program that a lot of people don't know about. So truly, sign up, and and if you want to go to a home game, that's the way to get a get a good seat. Yeah, and so so in that position, then the first half goals uh, from Arsenal were right, were in your near goal then. They were, uh, they were. So right. we. So, uh, so, so how much? How much did your thing move when you saw Elneny's cross heading Lacazette word? Oh, what! A, first and foremost, what a cross from Elneny. Um, but yeah, uh, a one touch cross on on a on a on a layback from uh, from Bellerin, I think. No, one yeah, one touch cross right on those heads. It's the only thing he could do with it because if he had taken an extra touch, he would have had two people on him. So beautiful. The play, Mike. I'll tell you something. The place was buzzing about La Gazette before the match. Like everyone was talking about him. Um, I, you know, I got a kit with his name on the back, and I was talking to the the printer, and he said, "No one is buying kits right now outside of La Gazette or Jaka because they don't know who else is staying." Um, right. So, and I thought that was that was interesting. And I and I asked him. I was like, "Hey, what if I got a number thirty one?" He goes, "I wouldn't." And I said, "Well, well I did." I, I did, but I'm you know you know he's going to be a different number next year. No, he's going to be a different number this year. There's <laughs> what? A, yeah, there's a lot of buzz that Gibbs is out in the next week, and he's going to take the last that goes to three. He's go to number three. So again, guy printing the shirts, teenage kid, who knows? But he just kind of said, "Yeah, we're printing them, and if they do change, and the number does change." Basically, what Arsenal will do is they'll go to the player and say, hey, a bunch of people bought your kit. What do you want to do about it? And typically, the player will say, I'll just pay for everyone to, to get, take care yeah, of the I kit. Yeah, because I got a home lock, uh, Coulson Act number 31, that, that's being delivered on, uh, on uh, tomorrow. So yeah. <laughs> we'll see how that works out. So can we talk about him for a second? Because for me, he was my man of the match. Yeah, and I mean I, he's not he's not exactly banging them in from twenty five yards, but I mean if he can just nick like forty five goals from inside the six <laughs> this season, I mean wouldn't wouldn't you take it? I would take it, um, but I, I know I texted to you during the match, but the moment Giroud's goal went in, and I don't know if they reflected this on TV, so answer I guess, but um, he literally the moment Lester put that ball down on the spot, he was screaming at. Everyone on the field. Like, he had the attention of every player standing in front of him. So nine other players. And he was pointing, and he was, you know, very vocal. And I thought to myself, we haven't had that for years. So you're talking about you're, you're talking about seed, then? Yes. Not, yes. Okay, all right. I, yeah, my goal comment was pointed at, at Lacazette. But, oh, no, but no. Yeah, yeah sorry. No, but you're absolutely right about Colasso. Yeah, I don't know if you saw that on television, but he was going to town on people. And it's kind of one of those where, you know, when a player yells at you and you kind of turn your head away, he had everyone's attention. And it was like, you know, five, six minutes left, just making sure that we saw the game out. But uh, I was really impressed with him. He was my man in the match. But, yeah, Lacazette <clears> – <throat> I, you know, I don't think we're going to be wrong, Mike, with the uh, the goal tallies we all predicted last pod. Um, oh, I'm hoping to be very low. I mean, the, the, it won't be 45, no, like I just said. But no. I think I said something like 16, and that's just because I, you know, I hate raising my expectations and then being disappointed. But I mean, you, you what a way to open your account. <laughs> Andy was telling me that you miss so many dings, and he's like, "I walk my dogs, and I just yell, Mike, you missed the ding.'" <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I miss them? Yeah, well, I'm trying not to uh, double the length of our podcast and lose you as a co-host. But um, No, so the the biggest takeaway for me with La Gazette was the, the two or three times he tracked back to defend. Um, yep. And then his footwork in and outside of the box. I mean, 
everyone gets slated him for, oh, he scores so many penalties. If he's earning those penalties, which I think he's going to earn quite a bit with that footwork, we've got a monster on our hands because he looked incredible. He really looked, he really looked good. His movement was off the chain, um, but the, his footwork is sexy. Mm, very sexy, sexy feet. The loins were getting warm watching his <laughs> footwork. Then, then, uh, well, and, and as, as excited as we all were at the two minutes, and I actually, I made some, you know, typical cheesy comment after, after 60 seconds about how Lacazette hadn't scored yet and needed to be sold. And so, like, a minute later, a minute later, he scores. But, uh, but then the unfunny comedy of errors begins. Uh, Petr Cech in, in the fifth minute. Jeez, bro. Uh, Andy Goley, what happened? Uh, they always tell you as a kid. If you are not going to get the ball out of the air, don't leave your six-yard box if you're not going to get the ball, right? This motherfucker left the field. <laughs> like, he was, like, behind the goal when they scored. And I, like, instantly, you could just tell it was his fault. And you got to give... Maybe it was Layman's influence, because Layman often leaves the field to go relieve Seriously, himself. but yeah, so you, can't, you can't fault anyone on that goal except for... Except for Czech. And I know so much hate went toward Xhaka for not getting that ball and clearing it. It was like, what do you expect? (laughs) Dude's in a defensive position, like, not knowing what the hell's going on, and the ball's being pipped over him, but yet... Check was and when Czech makes such a strong move, which he did, you, I mean, the, the players were, around him, are just gonna, they're going to defer to him because that's what you're supposed to do. Well, and absolutely, and I'll tell you this, like, if a keeper is yelling at the top of their lungs, usually as a player, you don't stop playing, but you're not on the, you're not on the knife's edge of right. the ball might go in, because you just, and especially with a keeper of Czech's caliber, you just assume if he's coming at full steam and calling for that, he's got the ball, Right. And he made a few. He made a few Neuer type of runs where, if there hadn't been a heavy touch on 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 the Leicester attacker side, he would have been foolishly out of position. I mean, his goalkeeping yesterday, unfortunately, was pony. No, it, it, thing. Um, I, love, I love that word. You're gonna get tired of that. He he was, uh, along with a handful of other players, not great in that match. He pulled off some fine saves, but. Yeah, that first goal, squarely his fault. He should never have left his line. Never so, have left his line. Twenty ninth minute, we fall asleep on defense again and, and all Brighton who uh one of my friends at the pub was saying prior to that is just he's good at one thing and that's whipping in crosses and he whipped in a killer one to the uh that rat face cocaine looking mofo. Uh, and, and then we've blown a lead already in the first half of the first game of the season. I'll tell you what, Mike. That was also, a that was also pony. <laughs> that was a beautiful goal, though. You, you got to give credit. I I work so damn hard in training with my girls to 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 get crosses in the box. I mean, you cannot defend that. It's almost impossible. And I know Jake is listening. And as a <laughs> as a winger, as a as a midfielder, whatever you, you got to that's where you become a great football player is when you can whip crosses in like that on the left and right foot. Because you, you think about it, Mike, as a defender, that ball's traveling so fast. If that nicks you anywhere, you don't have control. It could go in the back of the net, right? But yep. for Vardy to be able to connect to that on that speed and break two defenders is impossible to defend. Yeah, there, I mean, um, and, it, splits, it splits three people who are all moving in different directions and splits them in the most, uh, the perfect way. I yeah. Mean, I, yeah. I mean, I don't know if you can lay that on on the defender. I think it was Kolasinac that was tracking um, um, tracking back on Vardy, uh, but he was on the on the opposite side of Vardy. Mm-hmm. So I don't really know. There's much he could have done to get in front of that. I don't think there was. I don't think there was. And and if you are gonna get in front, you risk penalty. You risk right. deflection. I mean, it's just one of those where it's a beautiful goal, you know. And that, but that's what Leicester do. They they will they will push you and they will counterattack at high tempo and high pace. And let's be fair, Mike. I've already fucking hammered that in. That could have easily went over. So fair credit to him. Yeah. That was a good, that was a well deserved goal for them. Yeah, and and we needed so badly to get in to the to the locker room with a with a reassurance and we got it right before halftime uh, a little bit fortunate I went back and looked and, and it, you know it, it, at first it looked like Lacazette 
intentionally squib that ball through to, to Kolasinac, but I do think he kind of he might have been trying to spin and shoot, mm-hmm. and it deflects off of a Leicester defender's shin right into the path of Kolasinac. You got to give him credit for making the run, yeah. and then for unselfishly just putting it on a silver platter for Welbeck. I mean, Kolasinac could have could have broken his duck right there, but uh, but instead Welbeck gets the finish. Uh, even Welbeck couldn't miss from there. Um, <laughs> I think Kolasinac's going to have a hand in, in, in a lot more scoring. I mean, he, he's not just going to be a, a, a destroyer uh, and, and just a destroyer. I think he's going to get on the assist sheet and, and a handful of goals this season more than I even realized. Yeah. He's the opposite, he's the opposite of Pony. No, he um, he was he, – he's just one of those players where, you know, the more and more you see him, you just think, how is he in these positions? Because he goes from – you know, defending in his six, and then he's putting the ball across the goal for an assist. But um, he's fast. He is fast, and and he's like a tank. There's actually a fast, funny. There's a funny video football. of him reading tweets about himself on the Arsenal player, which is pretty good. But um, you know, you you made a comment about Welbeck. Um, even he could score from there, and I really have enjoyed watching Welbeck in the position he's been playing in. And uh, hopefully that's a boost of confidence for him to have scored that goal because he's had a couple opportunities, uh, Chelsea in the FA Cup, a couple like during the Chelsea in the Community Shield where he didn't put the ball away when he should have. So hopefully yeah. putting the ball in the back of the net, as simple as it was for him because it was a sitter, that, that boosts his confidence just a tad because you can tell that Arson has a lot of faith in him. Um, and yep. he's a great weapon to have out there. Like having him in the ox, whoa, that speed and skill is going to be amazing. Yeah, I, I, I love him, but uh, I haven't been feeling as good about him as a as a finisher. No, as I did when he first came back from injury and, and scored in that first game back. But yeah, I uh, agree. you know, it, it's that was a good deal going into halftime feeling confident. I said to. Uh, to my friends at the pub, I said, if we can get through the first 10, 15 minutes without conceding, it's like, I don't care if we score in the first 10 or 15 minutes. We cannot concede because we always do this and go behind. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm like, if we do that, we've won. If we don't do that, we're in trouble. And, of course, we did give up a goal just after 10 minutes of the second half. How? I mean, there's a, t- a statistic. I don't know if it's, it's factual or not, but apparently in the last 30 games – We've given up 77 goals in the first 10 minutes of the second half. <laughs> I think it might that it might be a fake stat, it might be fake news. But, it, it, but regardless, it's 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 mentality, right? It's um, it's getting the boys ready. Again, I think that falls on the shoulders of the coaching, the staff, and the leaders on the team. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, as a professional, you're you shouldn't be switched off like that. You should be revved up and and ready to go. And so, so hopefully so that keep, is fake. Keep on, yeah, keep an eye on that throughout the year because that that is uh, a potential downfall in a long season, and we certainly suffered from that last season. So to see it in the first game, not ideal. And 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 of course, the third goal is the you know the the zonal non marking looking incredible there and. And then, uh, you know, nobody's marking Templeton from Charlotte's Web. He's just all alone in front of the goal. Oh, God. <laughs> he has t- that. Only our old listeners are going to get that. But, um, uh, and, and, our, and our 13-year-old listeners who, who grew up with Charlotte's Web. But, that, I mean, the dude had time to snort an entire line of cocaine and wash it down with vodka before heading the ball past. I mean, that goal <laughs> doesn't go in if Kashoni and Mustafi are in the defense, right? I mean, it, just, it doesn't. It doesn't. I have faith that it doesn't. And But, um, again, when you're playing with what we're playing with, those are the type of goals that are going to go in. And, um, unfortunately, again, great goal for Vardy, but Czech should have saved it. Well, yeah, I've, I've heard a lot of goaltenders uh, like yourself um, – uh, on Facebook this week, basically saying, you know, there really isn't a whole lot he could have done on the third one. Nobody's blaming him for the second one, but the third one, people have also kind of said that was more about the defense. But anytime you give up an open header off of a off of a, a, a corner kick that you know that wasn't one that the goalie should have come and claimed out of the air, which I don't think that was. No, um, I you, just you look at the defenders in the zonal marking before you look at the key. Yeah, no, I, I look at them way before I look at him, but I also saw. Um, for me, and I went back and watched, it's just the positioning, the way he fell back. It's just, I don't know. 
Yeah. But at the end of the day, again, Vardy just pops up and he should never have been in that position to score that goal. Yeah. So then the subs come in and Ramsey and Elneny, uh, Ramsey coming in for Elneny, not surprising that, that, that's kind of a pre program type of thing. And, and frankly, uh, I'm looking forward to Ramsey. I'll get to him in a second, but, but Giroud in for holding. What's, is this tactical changing in game reacting to the situation we found ourselves in? What the hell? Seriously, I honestly, I thought to myself as that was happening, he's going for it and we would never see this before. But let's I mean, be honest. John too, you wouldn't have seen that before. No, but Holding was having a nightmare of a game. Yeah, I he mean, was. he looked poor. I mean, very poor. But um, yeah, you know, got to give credit where credit's due because we give him a ton of shit. Tactically, substitutions were spot on. El Nini did were. not have a great game. Ozil did not have a great game. I thought the Ox was somewhat poor until they moved him to the right side, and then we saw the Ox. We all know. Yeah, he, um, he went so, from being a little under to being potentially the man of the match it, it, once he was put to the right. Absolutely, and so I think that kind of highlights to Arson: you got to keep him on the right. But the 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 man of the match has to you know almost go to Arson because he made those tactics or uh, the subs. The one sub that I was like, "What the fuck are you doing?" and it, it was the Theo. Because, <laughs> well, of course. <laughs> well, and, and let me explain. Because Andy did we and, two and goals after Theo came in, or did he, we not score? Two but goals? but Theo didn't really have a hand in scoring those two goals. And as Andy put very suitably, we've tried this substitution with Theo to change a match for the past six years, and it doesn't work. And when the when the board went up, I thought, oh, he's bringing on a Wobi because I was thinking a Wobi would be that perfect player who could run at that defense and dance through it, you know, and create. And we bring yeah. on Theo, and Theo didn't. Theo played well. You got to give him credit. He tracked back on a couple and, and helped defend. But it's just like I literally, Mike. I sat there and I thought to myself, like when we were down before the subs came in, I thought, oh, maybe we'll just focus on Europa, and that'll be like our season. Because I just thought <laughs> it's the same old, same old, right? We're losing the mindset of the mindset of the gooner, and and and. Which brings me to a great question I'm going to ask you in a minute. But I'm looking and I'm thinking, all right, Ozil, gone missing. Holdings had a nightmare match. El Nini was poor. Out after the first three minutes where he had that beautiful assist, I thought he was atrocious. Um, Xhaka looked good, but not great. And so I'm just sitting there thinking, what in the actual fuck? You know? And then it was like, I, I, I thought to myself, if El Nini drops to the bench, and Ramsey comes on, we're going to have a different match. And that's exactly what happened. You know, and, and you got to give credit where credit's due to Arson because he made the right the right changes at the right time. Yeah, and and, and both of the subs score. Um, count me in as being increasingly excited about Jacques and Ramsey together in the middle. I mean, it, we saw it at times last season, but it just wasn't – I mean, Ramsey wasn't fit – uh, Xhaka wasn't completely, uh, you know, bedded in yet. Uh, this season, if the two of them can stay healthy, I think we will be missing Santi Cazorla a little less, not a lot, but a little less than than uh, than we thought we might. And I mean, just the first one, a great ball from Xhaka to find Rambo, and and an amazing first touch, a cool finish. What was Leicester doing on defense, protecting a three-two lead? They had seven guys basically standing on top of each other at the penalty spot, <laughs> marking Giroud. <laughs> and Ramsey and a couple of his buddies, some of them aren't even on Arsenal, uh, don't even play football. They were all just hanging out on the right side of the box waiting for the pass from Jaka, and it came. And, and then I came. I mean, it was it was beautiful. You know, then, well, y- y- yeah, I mean, those are the type of shots where Ramsey in the past would have skied it. But then there's this Ramsey Mike that shows up every fucking match, every match that we need him to, you know. And I completely agree with you. the 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 fact that him and Jaka are going to have this partnership in the middle, I think, is going to make the 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 miss of Santi a little bit more. You know, I would love to see Jack get healthy so he could rotate in with Ramsey. You know, because I think that if he stays healthy, he's at the same level of, of a Ramsey. But 
I was also super excited, Mike, when the lineup came out to see that Coughlin wasn't being slotted in and that El Nini was given that opportunity because he's looked solid. So it shows some recognition of what the rest of us have been figuring for a while. Exactly. Exactly. It's always nice. There's always nice when the coach uh, finally shows that he agrees with with what a bunch of unskilled. (laughs) I think we've all like. like I think we've all agreed that El Nini is not going to be your world class, make the biggest difference in a game player. But I'd love to see him in the Europa League. He's going to be a squad player. He's going to be a rotation player. And I love the fact that we didn't default to Coughlin. We said to, you know, he said, hey, Ramsey's hurt. Let's put on Linny in. We know he's going to do a shift. He's not going to play 38 matches for us. But you're right. The whole ramsey Jaka relationship is going to be beautiful once it gets kind of gets rolling. And, and hopefully they both stay healthy. Speaking of beautiful, Olivier <laughs> motherfucking Giroud. And I call him that because I've, I have it on good authority. He's fucked his share of mothers. Uh, <laughs> but, I mean, he's given me some unfamiliar feelings in certain parts of my body. I mean, not only did he score the winner in the most classic Olivier Giroud style, a header kissed off the bottom of the crossbar in the last five minutes while being double marked and pulled, pulled his jersey and, being, and have his feet knocked out from under him. But then he makes out with a badge after the goal. He, he performs anal on the badge and, and then comes out in the press and says, you know, he was given the opportunity to leave, but he wants to stay and fight. Um, and, and, and I mean, it just it was the, the triad of incredible Olivier Giroud things. And, and why would he not want to stay? I mean, I, I, know, I know he wants, you know, he wants to start uh, and, and, and who wouldn't. But he's on good wages. He's playing on a team that that, you know, where. The fans that don't hate him for whatever reason love him. And, you know, he's, he thrives in the super sub role, and, and he's 30 now. I mean, he's got to realize that if, he, if he's coming off the bench for 20, 25, 30 minutes uh, more often than he starts, he could extend his career by a couple years at least. Absolutely. And, you know, it's funny. My cousin and I were talking before the match. We were saying, you know, would you rather – and I'll pose this question to you. I actually have two for you. But would you rather have – a workhorse player who loves the club he's playing for or someone like Alexis Sanchez who's full of talent but you're not really sure where his loyalty lies I mean it depends it, it depends on, on on the situation if you're if you're barely holding on to quality as a team and and you're just going to fall off the map completely if that if that uber talented player leaves then I would I would be coveting and and taken after Alexis Sanchez, but that's not the position that we're in. No. Yes, yes, we'd be better off with Alexis than without him, but I would much rather have, uh, you know, the mentality of a guy like Giroud, Jaka, Kolasinac, even though they may not be as talented as Alexis. I'd rather have those guys uh, solidly through the starting eleven, and and not be so reliant on a on a prima donna whining crybaby that may or may not be Alexis Sanchez. Yeah. No, Giroud, I mean, credit where credit's due, had the opportunity. What would it take for you to sell? What would it, what would it take for you to sell Giroud? What, what offer? What amount at this moment in time for you to just sell Giroud and not replace him with anyone? Oh, I would say probably 20, considering he's – What? Still, yeah. My guess, you would accept a bid for 20? Yeah. For him? Well, oh. well I'm, thinking 30, I'm thinking 35 is not enough for me right now. Not – I mean – on the surface, it's a good haul for a 30-year-old, quote-unquote, slow forward who's you know likely to start declining in the next few years. But the impact he has on this club is dynamic. I mean, the guy is the anti-Theo because he knows exactly how to put the ball in the net in the biggest moments. I mean, he's got 10 goals as a sub in the last two seasons plus one game. No, I, and, you asked. I gave you a number. I would not sell him. Yeah, I, now I, I'm angry at you. Yeah, <laughs> I, wouldn't, I, should, I shouldn't have asked. I wouldn't sell him because, you know, we, we've talked about this before. He's going to be one of those great off-the-bench players. We're going to be able to put him into matches. Um, love bringing him in and then seeing La Gazette kind of get that free-roaming left-slash-central attacking midfielder type of a role. But... Um, in today's market, you could probably get 30 for a player like Giroud, but I, I love the fact that he has been offered the ability to leave and he wanted to stay. And I wonder if that was just respect out of out of Arson, you know, accepting an offer or saying, I'll accept it if you want to go and go back to France. And But 
power to him, man. He wants to stay and fight for that spot. And that's the type of player that we need, as you said. He will come in and score goals when he needs to. Um, and I and I think that the best thing for him as a player is to have to come off the bench and score those goals. Because yeah, I mean, I, it I, forces, he may not love that. He may not love it, and he'll start a ton of games. But he's kind of now fallen into that mold of the player who will come off the bench and score goals, and I think he loves that. You Which know, changes the way the other team's defense has to play. Absolutely. And that's never a bad thing, no matter whether you're up by a goal, down by a goal, or tied with, with 25, 30 minutes left. It, it, it can never be bad to force the defense to react. No. And, no. and too often we just give it to them and allow them to game plan for us, mm-hmm. and let's try to make it difficult for them, and, and that's one way to do it. Absolutely. So, so we, we end the game with 70% possession, uh, 23 tackles, uh, as a team, which which tells me what I what confirms what I saw visually, which is that we were pressing. Uh, Lacazette was excellent pressing uh, the defense from from when I when I was paying attention. Eighty five percent pass success and twenty seven attempts at goal compared to six from Leicester. So I mean, Leicester punished our mistakes uh, really really bad, but we were the far better team overall in the match. I think. No, no, I agree. Uh, we were not great. We were very poor. If we were playing a top four team, we would have been fucking annihilated. Uh, I think two of the Leicester goals came off of really shitty turnovers we gave them in our half. Um, There was a handful of players that were missing and terrible, but at the end of the day, we got three points, and that's all you can ask for. But we cannot stress, and I can't stress enough, we're papering over cracks, and... Every fucking year we go into the season with no center backs. And if we're truly, truly interested in winning this league, we need to bring another center back in. We have to. And it yeah. has to be a world-class center back. It can't be... It, it, There's it, only one was guy it, Well, it wasn't Callum Chambers playing. Was he injured? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know. I mean, he was... Uh, I remember seeing him on the bench, and he looked. he looked, he looked good. So... <laughs> Was it because that he was it because he played for for England um, under twenty threes or under twenty ones in the World Cup? How could you not be ready now? If exactly. You I mean, exactly. That, that, that's that's a little that's a little ridiculous. But when you say that you would have gotten annihilated by the top four teams, you are referring to Huddersfield, Burnley, uh, West Brom. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> those top four teams. Yeah, right? yeah. But we need there. Need, look, it's August. 13th, we're not going to make any big changes this season. Um, so this is the team, and we have to grind out some of these fucking wins. And so fair play to the lads. Uh, my man of the match, Mike, uh, was number 31. I thought he was outstanding. And I love the fact that he fucking turned and did his sick little you know, spin move on Mares. Um, oh, yeah. But uh, I, I thought he was outstanding. But then you got to give also fair mention to Giroud and, and Ramsey for coming on and changing the match like they did. Yeah, I mean, they, who's they your man been, of the match? My man of the match. Um, it's funny because Opta, you know, the the Opta ratings. Chambo got a nine point two, which is unheard of when you don't figure in any of the goals or assists. Mm-hmm. So I mean, that, his work on down the right side once he got Swish and and it seemed Beller on the left was interesting, uh, but. Uh, I mean, Chambo did a lot of work, uh, but I I, I got to give it to Jaka, um, Jaka or Lacazette. Um, you know, Lacazette more for the work he did than for the goal he scored. Uh, but I just I, Jaka, I think, is starting to become the player you thought he would be last season, yeah. or wanted or, or wanted him to grow into last season. And while it might have been Kalasinac shouting and rallying the troops instead of Jaka, um, you know, he, he's gonna. The the presence of Kolasinac is going to turn Jock into the leader he needs to be. Um, and I thought he was fantastic, and and you know he was the last one to touch the ball before the last two goals we scored were scored, yeah. which is also called an assist. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, mean, I just, can't I can't argue with you there. I, I argue it's he was. Here's the thing, Mike. We've got two guys now on this team that are clearly leaders. We've got two guys on this team who are going to get stuck in. They're going to get yellow cards. They're going to get red cards. Our fucking fan base is so fickle when it comes to, oh, I don't want a player who plays like that. It's like, we didn't complain when Vieira did it. 
We right, need to come I'm, play I'm, Lin Keon. I got right. So yeah. it, we need players on this team that are going to stand up and they're going to be men that 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 put their feet in and they and they get nasty when they need to. And we've got two of those now. And I, fair credit to the management team for bringing both of them in, um, and and probably have two guys who can who can run this team as captains. Um, but I want to say one thing about the Ox, Mike. Every time he got the ball, there was a buzz around the Emirates. Literally, like, people got out of their seats. And because he has that ability to just drive the ball, and I don't, like, next time you fly over, just watch it. Because I've never seen that before with him. But every time he got the ball, it was kind of like everyone was like, all right, it's fucking on. Like, we're going, you know. And I, I, I really hope he kind of senses that vibe. And I'm That's sure he crazy. does. For, for, a player, for a player that doesn't score 15, 20 goals a season, no. for that kind of buzz when he gets on the ball is, is impressive. But my cousin turned to me and said, I would I would take a player of his caliber at Everton any day of the week. And I, and I <laughs> joked. And I said, well, you take any of the Arsenal players. He went, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> but uh, But he was just saying that he's like, he just said, you can't lose him. You just can't lose him. You know, and I'm like, I don't think we will. I think he'll, I think he'll extend. But he just had that, like, every time he got the ball, it just seemed like there was a, there was a, uh, a hype around the, uh, the stadium, which was really neat. So, nice. That's yeah. that's uh, that's awesome. I, I, you can feel that across the across the ocean, but it's it, it's it's definitely going on in the Emirates, which is nice because the Emirates could use some opportunities to get excited. Um, speaking of getting excited, uh, any good stories from after the match? So uh, that you're at liberty to discuss. We went to Twelve Pins, uh, which is uh, I've actually never been there. I don't think. No, so uh, right, right down the street from um, Finsbury Tube Station, Tube Stop. Um, apparently, it's a big Tottenham bar when they play their home yeah. matches or did. Um, and then after matches, obviously with the Arsenal, it's a big Arsenal pub. So, uh, we went to 12 pins. Uh, like I said, Mike or Andy was supplying me with a lot of, uh, whiskey. Uh, could give us Twitter handle a plug. Do you, do you know it? I don't know it off the top of my head. I'll find it in a second. Andy gets her 46. Yeah. The guy was just so much fun to be around. Absolutely. Absolutely great. Um, but no, we, uh, we just went and had some drinks and then, I get home around 12.45, and I'm like, you know, he's, he should be honored I did this, Mike. So it's like, I'll just quickly check Twitter, and I get a message on my phone. It's Ola. I missed my train. What do I do? And I'm like, come crash at my place. And Which so, is hilarious because we talked about how you're kind of, you know, when he was joined us on the podcast last week. We yeah, about we him joked night. about him staying on my couch, and then he did. Um, <laughs> and then I woke up the next morning, and he was gone. So yeah, he, I saw a tweet from him when he was leaving because, of course, I was still awake at the, at all crazy hours of the night. Yeah, um, and he's, I'm leaving, but but Andy's sleeping. <laughs> so this was this was actually really funny. Um, so we're we're standing around the outside and we're just having a great time. And and uh, Andy says to Lee judges, "Why aren't I allowed on your away bus? Because apparently there's a they they drive a bus right to these away matches, and you had to go around and give three songs." That will be added to a playlist, and if they don't like your three songs, you're not allowed on the bus. So <laughs> Lee made us go around in a big circle and give him his three songs uh, that we would choose to go on the away uh, on the bus. And so I don't know whose bus it is. The, the really tall guy, um, fuck, super super nice gentleman. But we'll, we'll figure that next pop. We're gonna get uh, your three songs that that we'd take on the bus, and we'll see if Lee likes them. But. Um, <laughs> But the other question I was asked was, would you give up being an Arsenal supporter? Like, if you could change your football team, would you do it? What? Yeah. What kind of question is that? Well, because it was a fair Are question. Are you seriously asking no, me no, that question? No, yeah, no, it's a fair question. Here's why. Because as an Arsenal supporter, you, you're you never, like, so we were talking about it. Like, as a West Brom supporter, you know kind of where you stand, right? You're going into the season, Maybe you'll have a cup run, but you know where you're going to finish. As an Arsenal supporter, and these were from people outside looking in, they're like, it must be so frustrating to to, to just never know where your club's going. You're never actually going to be competing for the title, but you have the thought that you can, right? And I was like, 
I said to him, I said, never in a million years. I said, because then I would never have had the Invincibles. Like, like even my cousin said, from the time that he's, in, like, we've known each other, which has been 30 plus years, he's like, Andy's never seen anything other than Arsenal. But for a lot of people, they're like, I could totally walk away from this club if I had the opportunity 10 years, 15 years ago, if I knew what was going to happen now because of frustration. I just thought, no, never. I could never do it. Well, let me give you. Let me give. But it must be nice. But it. But it must be nice for some supporters to know exactly where they stand every season. You know. Well, you know, I, I, th- that's one way of putting it. I, I think they'd rather not know which top four position they're going to finish in than know they're going to finish in twelfth every year. Right. We actually. When, when, last time I was over in London, we were at a pub uh, where we happened to be hanging out with a West Brom supporter um, who worked at the pub, and and. Um, so we, you know, we kind of talked about that a little bit. He had, he had interesting feedback about it. I'll go into another time, but you know, I became an Arsenal supporter 30 years ago in two like amazing, glorious years over in London as a teenager. And then I came home to the States in an area where the, you know, there was no internet. There was no, I mean, there was no way to keep in, in touch with the team. Um, and you know, then I went to college, then I started a family and, and, you know, 15 years goes by and my son starts playing soccer and you know I, I started getting back into it again but i mean was there there was no possible thought process of, at the time in 2006 saying you know okay let me reselect my team based on who's good now and who's you know i mean obviously arsenal had just been through a period where they were probably you know if i had done that they would have been the top team anyway but uh, i mean there was no question it was arsenal uh, I think fifteen years, fifteen years away or not, it was Arsenal, and, and yeah. it just got stronger and stronger. So I mean, I, I insulted that anyone would think that anyone, if you would change your team because of the frustrations we've been through the last twelve years, if we want to call them frustrations, then you're not someone I want to be hanging out with. I think that the the question was really posed around that um, a lot of season tickets weren't renewed. And I think a lot of the Arsenal fans right now are just so frustrated with the same old. I think it kind of hit that boiling point. And well, that may just be about whether they want to devote well, uh, it's the, their the, income to it, the, not going the, to support other the teams. The time and income, but um, a good friend of mine um, who I got to meet up with, she was like, you know, I just. Back in the day, I would watch every Arsenal match, I would listen, follow. She's like, I'm not that way anymore. And she said, until the regime changes, and I think she's more managers and coaches, she's just like, I just don't have the love for it that I had two seasons ago. You know? Well, that, and, that's and, one thing. Yeah, but and so, and that's where. The, with another team? But no, no, no. That was where the question was posed. Like, if you could, if someone said to you five years ago, this is what it's going to be like for the next five to 10 years, or 10 years ago, would you have walked away then? And the, everyone agreed no, but I was just curious, you know. Um, and like you did with the NFL, you walked away because you just didn't enjoy it anymore. So there's a point, I think, for people over here that where they were just like, enough's enough. Yeah, um, that's true. I, but I, I, in the same breath, Mike, everyone was yeah. saying to me how fucking lucky they are because I that they this is their backyard. Because they, they were saying to me, like, oh, is this your first time? And because the accent, a lot of people don't know me. I said, no, I'm from here. You know, I've, I've, I went to Highbury. I saw the, the you didn't old... Wear a, you didn't wear a jacket that said, you know, I'm actually right. from... Right, no, right. So, like, <laughs> yeah. So, um, so, but they, they were, like, they just... I think a lot of them just don't know how lucky they are that they get to see yeah. this team week in and week out in the flesh. And so, but I, I do want to say to anyone still listening of my ramblings, thank you so much uh, for making me feel at home. It was just it was fucking brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Awesome. Well, so, we have uh, we, we, we have a number of listener questions. Some of them should be pretty quick answers, but I want to want to try to get them all in if I can. Yeah. So um, actually, I, I, I don't know why I just call them listener questions. They're user questions. <laughs> um, <laughs> Mike Hernandez um, <laughs> at USA Gooner 1886 been very interactive lately on Twitter. We love him. Uh, he asks uh, and this one's for you, Andy. Why does it burn when I pee? Are we sure this is from Mike Hernandez and not you? Just <laughs> like, do you have something you want to tell me, Mike? <laughs> um, no, I mean, I, I, I assumed you'd be able to solve. Yeah, no, problem. I can. As a as a medical professional, I can tell you, Mike, that it sounds like a worm has crawled up your penis, 
has laid eggs in your urethra, and uh, that is where the burning sensation is coming from. Oh, I was just going to ask him if he recently had a dream about Olivier Giroud because that <laughs> that could also be responsible. But That's definitely I, my thing. I, I, I like I like yeah. your answer better. Yeah. <laughs> Any medical questions? Send them over to Doctor Andy, and I'll I'll whip around and and help you out. Nice. Yeah. Um, well, I bet you you're glad you listened to the podcast now, Mike Hernandez. Um, <laughs> another question, no, a first time question now at Ibby Broccoli. Um, I don't know whether this is a man or a woman, a boy or a girl, but I do know that this person likes broccoli. Well, good for them. Uh, Probably great bowel movements. <laughs> Incredible. <laughs> um, asks, why do we forget how to play football in the first game? Andy, is, do we and why? And if we do, why? <sighs> I don't know if it's just the Friday night thing. Have we played enough preseason matches. It's just it wasn't Friday night the last four years. I know <laughs> what it's so weird. Again, we gotta just fault it up to the management not getting them ready. Uh-oh. Yeah, and I think that's a pretty straightforward answer. I, I have nothing cute to say about that. But uh, another first time questioner, Clayton Chai or Clayton Chai, depending on whether he's uh, it's Hebrew or not, uh, or he just in Chai T. Yeah, and he's from Oklahoma, so I'm guessing it has nothing to do with Hebrew. Um, Asked two things. First, seeing as how our comeback came when we switched to a back four, would you recommend going back to that? Now, did 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 we switch to a back four? I felt like we switched. That's tough to say when you're watching it live because you're just in that. And, or when you're watching at a pub. I mean, I, I agree. Yeah, and I, I, it's a great question. We should go back and and take a look, but. I mean, when Holden came off for Giroud, I, you know, obviously I was surprised to see the, the, the change in tactics, but, and, and Holden was having a mare, but, you know, the three that were remaining in the back, I mean, you assume Bellerin slotted back, uh, Nacho was still in there, and Kolasinac. So who would have been the fourth? Ox? Jaka? I mean, I, I, I kind of thought it was more of a 3-5-2 at that point. Yeah, I, I thought so, too. I, I saw more of a 3-5-2 in my... You know, but I have... But my my uh, my attentiveness was not at peak uh, performance, uh, if you know what I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, it, but if we went back to a back four and that was contributed to our comeback, I, I I still don't think that I would make any changes to go back to a traditional back four, at least not for a general rule. And and Clayton also asked, uh, you know, he'd like to see Lacazette and Giroud up top together. What changes to the team would you make to make this happen? I think you'd almost have to go to a, a flat back and go to a full four two. Um, interestingly, Clayton, no team has ever won the Champions League final with three in the back. So I almost feel like if you are going to play and challenge, you have to have a flat back at four at some point. So I would revert to that for certain fixtures um, tactically, but I think that the Premier League is kind of morphing into that three five two. So you want to match the three five two because remember when we lost to Chelsea, they overran our midfield. I mean, absolutely annihilated us because we kept losing the ball in there with just two. I mean, Jaka and I think Cochran were running around like with their heads cut off, you know. And so you almost have to match like for like, and it's almost like every team is going to that three five two. I know West Ham and Man United were almost in it today as well. So I think there's certain teams you can go out and do it. I think against Bournemouth, Huddersfield, we could probably do it. But against the top boys, we're going to have to go like for like. But for us yeah. to play with Lagazette and Giroud, I think we go four four two flat out. Well, and I like to see them play together in the in the exact situations that we saw them play together on Friday, which is mm-hmm. you know to, to 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 switch things up and change the game. Um, I don't know that I want to see those two starting up top together. Um, you know, I, I'm sure we will at some point, but I, I, you know, I'm still against Giroud starting games uh, that you know that are important, need three point type of games, just because of the the, the different you know the, the way that the, the defense can game plan for him from the start. So situationally, yeah, but uh, I mean, if there's a better striker in the game about being next to another number nine on the pitch than Giroud, I don't know. Who that would be. Right. Next question is from our boy Rob Ford, who I absolutely adore. And and he's got the, this guy has the best side boob of any guy I know. Oh, that's, uh, I, I've, I know Rob not as well as you, and I did not know he had that. Um, oh, it's incredible. Rob and I, there's, there's Rob a, and I hurt. Go ahead. Rob and I hurt on 
on two different sporting team fronts because he's a big Cowboys fan like me. So we we cry more often than most other Arsenal fans. When you're a Cowboys Arsenal fan, there's way more tears. Well, you deserve, you deserve each other as far as that's concerned. But uh, do either of you think there's a reasonable and practical way to hurt Stan Kroenke enough financially or politically that would make him want to give up on Arsenal and sell? Or is his ownership too big to fail? And uh, There's no way that we're ever going to be able to hurt Stan financially because I believe he made a comment when he first took over the club because there was the whole concern of – United were bought by American owners, Aston Villa were, and financially they're not doing great. And I remember he said something along the lines of, my wife's a Walton, we'll never have to yeah. worry about money. So financially, Stan's never going to get hurt. I think I think the exact quote was, nya, 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 nya. you can't hurt me financially. <laughs> yeah. So. Again, politically, I don't see, there's no way. And I know Rob was going on the whole, I'm not going to buy a kit, and... Um, he just bought a kit. <laughs> right. And, but, you know, fair play to him because he had that mindset and he didn't want to do it. And then the new kits came out and they look, they're gorgeous. But I don't think – the guy is just so rich. It doesn't matter. I, but you can affect Stan because you saw what happened with that hunting show that he had. And that has now been put to bed. And, and I feel like a lot of that was driven by the Arsenal supporters uh, and the petitions that they they had. But – He's our owner, and at the end of the day, Mike, he's still signing players. We've broken our transfer record twice now while he's been our owner. So yeah. if he keeps if he keeps giving the, the funds to buy players, great. Um, and I can't believe for a second that the Lamar deal isn't over the line because of Kroenke. It's got to be yeah. because our wage bill is too high. We have Deadwood. And I'm sure if yeah. we ship those Deadwood out, he would say, go ahead and do it. So at the yeah. end of the day... He sucks because he's never around. We want an owner that's at the at the club who actually knows who we're playing week in and week out. But I don't see him being the problem. What I'd like to see, Mike, is in five years from now when a new manager rolls in, what Stan Kroenke's like at that point. Five years from now? For someone who doesn't act like he cares that much about Arsenal or about football, period, um, at least this kind of football, um, he, he acts like he cares a whole hell of a lot about owning Arsenal. Um so, I mean, if the Miami Marlins baseball team is worth $1.2 billion, then Arsenal must be worth like $469 billion. Seriously. So, so I think we got to get that Nigerian businessman, Aliko Dan, Dangote, uh, this guy that keeps talking about wanting to buy Arsenal. If he puts up a bid of $469 billion for the team, I think we can get Kroenke to sell. But anything short of that, he's, he's around for the long haul. Mm-hmm. Uh, Another one of my local buddies, David Levinson at Doby Junior Fifty One or Doby Jr Five One. Um, he asks, "Where are my Baconator fries?" <laughs> and, <laughs> you son of a bitch! People are people haven't forgotten yet. Uh, this that's... is what happens. This is what happens when you when you let the man take over the Twitter account for just a little bit. All of a sudden, I'm obligated to buy people things. Well, so, yeah, I'm sorry, but David, your and I, can't even, I can't even use I can't even use the excuse with David that like that it won't fit in the mail and that they won't allow me to mail it because I see the guy regularly. So I guess at some point him, I'm like two <laughs> fries after you get done eating some, and then well, I'm not eating fries, anymore. Uh, but yeah, I'll uh, yeah, I'll probably uh, I'll humor him. But that doesn't mean that I'm giving them to everybody else. That was not an authorized transaction to make. Um, question from our buddy Chaz. Uh, we'll be uh, figuring out when his next appearance on the podcast will be. CNB. Hopefully soon. CNB. Chaz Nuki Burden asks, what made Andy laugh most about England? I don't know if he means about England or like while whilst you've been in England. <laughs> Um, well, Chaz is kind of on my shit list at the moment because he made comments about Harry Styles. I'm not sure he can take back. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Meanwhile, we're making like like comments about beef and and uh, I mean we're, we're we're talking about all the things that he dis- detests. Yeah. But Harry Styles, he makes one comment about Harry Styles and he's on your shit list. Yeah. Yeah. No. Um, <laughs> what's made me laugh most about being back in England? Was that the question? Yeah. Um, you know what? I uh, I kind of laughed a lot at my uncle yesterday. 
I haven't seen him for a while. I laugh, at your, I laugh at your uncle all the time. I laughed at my cousin, you know, showing up to an Arsenal match as an Everton fan. That was kind of fun because, you know, you got to see what real football looked like. But, um, you know, oh, you know what made me laugh a lot today, Mike? I don't know why, but we were down in, in South Sea, which is where my family live, and there's a big kite festival. And, I mean, these people are nerds. Okay. I apologize <laughs> to any kite nerds who listen to our podcast. But they did, like, a synchronized kite show to like very the Benny Hill theme <laughs> no, no it, that would have been way better it was what's the uh, chariots of fire is that the song, is that oh, the yeah, song? Yeah. and yeah, it's yeah. just like my cousin turned or my brother-in-law turned because you know people have spent like hours preparing for this and we they, it, only in England could you go to a kite festival I don't know anywhere else in the yes. world that has a kite festival, but yeah. Nerdistan. So, yeah, Nerdistan, exactly. <laughs> like, my brother in law was, well, he's really my sister's boyfriend. He's like, this is making me so emotional. I might go and propose to your sister at this point. So, uh... what? <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> That's possibly the greatest song ever. All right, we got to whip through a couple more of these. Um, oh, next one Ding. is from. Uh, Princess Gunner Amanda, who you had the pleasure of meeting. I got to see all kinds of pictures and FaceTimes of the two of you together, um, which I promptly saved to my hard drive. Oh, and I will say another uh, moment that made me laugh a lot was when when I FaceTimed you or you FaceTimed me at the pub, the look of sadness on your face when everyone was grabbing the phone and we were just <laughs> singing and dancing, jumping in a circle, and you just looked like you had been beaten with a baseball bat. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty much how I felt. But that uh, was brilliant. Yet I'm still not. I'm not angry for you doing that. I appreciated it, but it it, it did kind of turn the knife in my in my wounds a little bit. But yeah. so so Amanda asks uh, at Gooner Girl 19, 1969. She hasn't changed her, her and her Chaz. Chaz should have really come and met up with me before the match. So did you did you ask him to? No, I didn't. But we could have talked about our Harry <laughs> Styles. Should have just known where you were going to be. Come on, man. <laughs> Who is Andy's favorite gooner that he met Friday night? And I'm guessing it had to be Bobby Chakrabarty. Oh, right? dude, I feel so bad because Bobby met us at the Pie Berry in a big group. Pie we were like, let's walk over to a new pub. I assumed he was on the back because I didn't really get to talk to him. I was eating. I said, when I'm done eating, I'll chat. Well, like, he'll come over and talk. Um, and then when we got to the pub, I turned around and said, where's Bobby? And everyone's like, where the hell did he go? And then there was no reception in there, and I texted him, and, and he didn't have a ticket, and we ended up having an extra, and so I feel really bad, Bobby, so I really apologize. Now, did, that he, did he know you ended up having an extra, or did you no, just, he like, didn't, further ruin his dude, entire life? But... Ola just came by an extra ticket, and, and so we had an extra, which Ola just sold to someone on the street for face value. Um, but that was way after, uh, that was right before the match, so I apologize, but... Um, yeah, I see where her question came from. Loved meeting. Honestly, they were just all so amazing. I mean, they truly, truly were. I can't get over how Will genuinely... you give her what she wants, please? Yeah, Amanda was the best. <laughs> she was. She's the big... Because we're never coming on her podcast unless we give her what she wants. Right I know, now, so. and I think I'm also congratulately obliged to tell everyone that she has over 14,000 Twitter followers as well. And they apparently all came up to her on the streets of Highbury. Before you know the what? Game. Twice people came up to her and like said, "Hey, Amanda," gave her a kiss on the cheek, and she was just like, "Who was that person?" <laughs> <laughs> One of them was her dad. <laughs> but <laughs> no, but right. every I'm everyone very... everyone was just so nice, and and um, you know, she gave such good props for the pod, and we're super excited to have her on, and and Ola. Tom, like, honestly, they were just such, such great people. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, another good person is... is Johan! Nay! At John Anthony R4. I'm not letting you butcher it this week. Uh, Gooner Dove I, it gets, a, gets a chance for... Well, actually, you get the chance for redemption. What is his Twitter handle now? Johan. Um. <laughs> Johan. All right, uh, Gooner Dub. If, as expected, we focus on getting rid of the Deadwood and don't strengthen further with new purchases, is this acceptable considering where we finished last year in fifth? Like, it's a really good question, and the, honestly, the answer is no. It's not acceptable. This team should be challenging 
for the title. We need to get rid of a few players. If it's truly the matter of having to remove three or four wages before we can add a Lamar-type player or a Mares, then we should have done that weeks ago. That should have been identified, and they should have been caught. Gibbs doesn't look like he's going to make this team, especially with uh, Kalashnik in there. I mean, the guy is an absolute beast, and there's no way a player like Gibbs is going to go into the, the squad before him. And so we need to get rid of these players, and we need to strengthen. And there's only a couple areas we need to strengthen, Mike. So yeah. I don't think it's acceptable you know, where we're at right now if we don't get rid of this Deadwood. Now, if we do remove them, then we have to bring in a few players. And I think if we do yeah, he's that, saying if we if we are able to get rid of them, but we don't add anyone else. Yeah, then it's bullshit. Absolute bullshit. Summer. No. Yeah. No. Yeah. All right. I, I tend to agree with you. I, I also tend to think that we're going to get rid of these guys on August 31st. And there's going to be – and then they're going to say, but, well, you know, so, there so, wasn't enough time to really work out a deal for anybody else let, coming in. Let's look at Giroud for a second, right? You have a world-class player in Giroud, plays for France, plays for Arsenal, will go down as a great player for us. You bring in Lagazette, and Duke gets pissed. And these two guys are friends, right? I mean, they are probably very close. But you're bringing in a player that is so good, he instantly makes your starting 11. That's the type of player we should be bringing in next. So if we're not bringing in Lamar, go for Mares. Because once you have Mares and Theo on your bench, Mike, who are you going to play? Yeah, exactly. But what does Theo do? Theo realizes he's not going to start, and then he ups his game. And that makes him a better player. And so you, like, get rid of Joel Campbell. Get rid of um, Gibbs. Just get, release him. Just release Joel Campbell for free. Remove and them and, and bring in those players that are going to make – Instant impacts that are gonna that are gonna start for us, but they also force the other players to be better, right? I would yeah. love for us to bring in a central midfielder that would make Ramsey think, "Shit, I need to play better." Not because Ramsey's not good enough to play. I'm not saying we need to replace Ramsey, right? What I'm saying is, we bring in a player that all of a sudden makes Ramsey say to himself, "I need to be better if I want to play on this team." That's what you need to do. Yeah, right. just because just because Real Madrid has Isco doesn't mean they're not bringing in a player that also plays Isco's position who might be as world class or or as quality. Gareth Bale yeah. said the exact same thing a couple uh, um, when they were talking about him going to United when they played in America, and he said when you play for Real Madrid, your expectation and it's not quote for quote right word for word excuse me, but he said when you play for Real Madrid, the expectation is you, they're going to bring in players that are going to be better than you. And that you had then have to fight for your place, and it was basically him saying, "I'm staying here to fight for my place." So, yeah. you know, and that's the mentality that we should be having as a, as a club, you know. Um, so that, yeah, thanks a lot, Johan. Appreciate it. No, I'm just <laughs> yeah. kidding, man. <laughs> at, at some point, he's going to end up actually legally changing his name to Johan before we actually adjust. Johan Forney, please. Last but not least, uh, Tokyo Gunner asks, do you guys think Arsenal will finish ahead of Spurs this season realistically? And if yes, what's the reason? Quick. What Dude, do you think? love Tokyo. Um, I would say that uh, yes, because they're not strengthening. They're going to have some trouble with Wembley. And let's be honest, Mike, they didn't have a lot of injuries last season. And so that's going to catch up to them. And uh, I think that we will finish above them. I, I, I tend to agree with, for you with the exact same reasons. And I actually uh, I want to give a shout-out to uh, Tyler Dunn from Chicago. I actually, uh, his, his Twitter is at T-D-U-N-N-E Soccer. Uh, he has a podcast, uh, g- a general football uh, podcast, soccer podcast, and, and uh, had me on as a guest earlier today. It should be up soon to talk a little about Arsenal. And, and we, we talked about Tottenham, of course, and Wembley. And, and I, I said – Pretty much the same thing that you just did, which is, you know, they're they're unsettled right now. Um, the the only reason that they've done as well as they have the last two years is because of very good coaching, very good luck with injuries, um, and and a, a kind of a solidity and a continuity to their team. And all those things are under assault right now. I mean, they've lost a player or two and haven't haven't added anybody. There's some disunity within the team coming from from uh, from Rose, Danny Rose. 
Uh, you're going to see more of that, I think. And and they're just you know there's there's something to be said about not going to uh, you know your your own home stadium and your own home locker room and your own pathways that you normally go and having to go to a kind of a a more generic place like Wembley, even though it's an incredible place. And, and play there, and and so uh, I mean I pegged them for sixth to eighth place somewhere this season. You know they started off this morning fine, but you know I, I think we'll be ahead of them this season, and, and maybe for maybe for the next you know three, four, sixteen seasons in a row, something like that. <laughs> so we got some picks, and um, yes. and, and we have a, bring a, a guest. Bring in a guest the ringer. The ringer. Now, now, first of all, I just want to talk about last week because our guest spot was was ably filled by the team of Lee and Ola, um, and um, Arsenal got off to a flying start, and so did your boy Mike. Perfect three for three, thanks to uh, Watford equalizing in, in injury time against Liverpool. So we got me at three, Andy at two, and the guest spot at two. This week we have a very special guest who I gave birth to uh, fourteen years ago. You actually gave birth to him. I am still recovering from that, by the way. <laughs> um, but uh, last year on our third or fourth podcast of the season, he appeared and did guest picks, um, and, and that was when no one was listening. So he's a little more I nervous. I was going to say, like, outside of our moms, wouldn't Jake be our number one and oldest fan? Uh, our our longest standing fan, perhaps. Yeah. Uh, he's 13, but he's a man in the eyes of the Torah. Uh, ever since last October, Top Gooner, my son Jake, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. It's nice to be on again. <laughs> it's nice to have you. Yep. You're looking good, by the way. Uh, you can't see this, but Jake has a Giroud jersey on, uh, the the away jersey from last year with with Giroud. So not only is is he handsome, but he's got a handsome shirt on as well. Um, and we're going to do three games today, and we're going to let the guests go first today. Um, okay. So the first game is Newcastle at Huddersfield Town. Jake, what do you think? All right. Well, this game sounds like the crap game of the week. (laughs) Yes, this is the crap game. We're going to edit it to the crap game of the week this week. And with that being said, this is going to be complete crap. So (laughs) I'm thinking that Newcastle is probably more prepared for the Premier League than Huddersfield Town. So I'm thinking Newcastle gets the win at 1-0. 1-0 at Huddersfield Town. Okay. It is uh, the battle of the promoted teams. Um, I'm going to think uh, it's at Huddersfield, so, I mean, this is their home debut. Uh, they're going to shock the world and stay top. Two to one, Huddersfield. Andy, what do you think? All right. Um, I'm going to go two all draw. Nice. All right. Some goals. Huddersfield's in the goals early in the season. All right. The second game, a pretty big quote-unquote top six battle pretty early in the season. Chelsea at Tottenham to, to to start off the season. Tottenham won the first week. Chelsea, we all know what happened to them. Uh, Jake, what do you think? Well, I'd love it if both teams could lose, but... Um, <laughs> That'd be nice. Well, closest to that will probably be a tie. If both teams lose points, um, I'm thinking 1-1. 1-1, all right. Any idea who's going to score for Chelsea? Uh, Put them on the spot. I don't know. Um, Hazard has been great the past few seasons, so I'm thinking he'll stay up there and score a goal. All right. If he's playing, he's scoring. All right. Um, and and I think uh, they'll get four or five more red cards in that, in that game. Okay. <laughs> Battle of the human waste products uh, at <laughs> Wembley. Neither of these teams can win worth a, a damn at Wembley at all. I'm trying to keep my language uh, somewhat respectable, even though he's been sitting here the whole podcast. He's now hanging over my shoulder. So uh, because neither of these teams can win at Wembley, they won't. Uh, I'm also going with a tie 2-2. Two to two. Andy. Ooh. You have an opening here to uh, to pick up a point. <laughs> yeah, but I, I also thought 2-2 two to two as well. Well, if that's what you thought, you should go with it. That's what I'm going with. Nice. All right. Or as so. we say in England, two all. Ding. <laughs> By the way, I was criticized earlier today uh, for posing a question to Amanda for her podcast, which we're going to retweet uh, and, and make sure everyone's listening to. Um, I said something about after Vardy scored his second go-ahead goal of the game and immediately by Danny of, of Burkett Wonderland 
was slammed for yes, my I botch. English. Okay, explain to me what I did wrong there because I'm 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 hip to 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 a lot of the the differences between American English and and English English. But what did I do wrong there? I'd have to go back and see exactly what you said. Um, I said the, the second go ahead goal of the game. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, they went, they went ahead, and it was the second time they went ahead. I mean, is it a, is is that just not sayable? I don't know. Danny, tell us what he did wrong. <laughs> tell me what I did wrong. All right. Well, just criticize me. Help me. <laughs> um, all right. So uh, Arsenal at Stoke is obviously the third game. Um, hopefully we'll get out while we still can. Um, you want to be bad, Shawcross? Oh, I, hold on. All right, I'm going first in this one because I've already started reading my uh, <laughs> my pre-written thing. Uh, you want to go studs up, Charlie Adam? I would like to introduce you to Saeed Kolasinac. <laughs> Suck it. Three to two, Arsenal. <laughs> Jake, what do you think? Well, it's hard for me to think that Arsenal's going to lose, lose to Stoke, although Stoke is at home. But um, I'm still thinking that Arsenal wins 2-0, and I'm hoping that Lacazette can continue his – Excellent start to this Premier League season. Andy or uh, uh, Danny, did you hear that? He said two nil, and he's thirteen. So suck it, uh, or as you say in England, as you say in England, suck it. Uh, Andy, what do you think? Um, I say we win three two. All right, <laughs> so you're you're tying with you're going at the same score as me again. Yeah. All right, um, so that does the picks of the week. Uh, quick question: What's the little status of your little fantasy EPL league? Did, did you did you not follow through on that? No, no, no. We um, we do have a Premier League fantasy uh, league. We will. I'll tweet back out our um, our league code. But we, we we actually have a decent amount of people in there. Um, I know you were. Did like, anybody like did you have to like set a team for this week, or did everyone do that? We did actually. Let me go in and take a look. Um, you know what's really weird though, Mike, is I don't know. I'm in last place, motherfuckers. League's canceled. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, it, I, I no one, fan. no one goes by their Twitter names on here, so it's just everyone's real names. But no, we have people in there. I'll retweet it. We'll get you back out, um, Mike. I did have a quick Andy's musing. Um, an Estonian side scored an own goal 15 seconds into the match without the opponents actually touching the ball. I so uh, great great for um, Lavadia. But then, what? That was the name of the team, Lavadia. Oh, I thought you were just having a stroke or something yeah, well, like that. Well, I did as well. No, the uh, yeah that that as 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 the men in Blazers often say, that's so Spursy. Um <laughs> But yeah, the 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 fantasy thing. I mean, look, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna I, I'm interested in how it goes, but I'm I'm certainly not not getting involved in it because I mean, if someone had come up to me at the pub on Friday, like almost you know, in the 80th minute, and say, "Oh, well, at least I started Vardy in my fantasy league," I would have been arrested for socking the guy in the penis. Well, look, I mean, at the, at that the, at that's the type of thing that that makes me go absolutely nuts about this. My son's laughing right now. But, the um, uh, Roger Kendrick is in first place. Um, he's a Dodgers fan, apparently. Um, he's actually in first place by quite a bit. We'll do updates throughout the season, but yeah, I want to hear about it. I want to hear about it during the pod. I just don't want to hear about it during the Arsenal game. That's after week thing. one, you know, you know what happened, Mike? Is I had Gary Cahill and Fabregas in my team. Both <laughs> got red cards. <laughs> do you get extra points for red cards? No, nope, they got me negative four. All right. Uh, next week, we, speaking of aggressiveness and red cards, we do play Stoke. Um, although I'm, I'm having a, a positive feeling about this one right now, may get a player or two back in the lineup that uh, that we didn't have available for the first game, like a Mustafi, like a, maybe a start from Ramsey. Uh, are you feeling positive, negative? <clears throat> I'm more positive about this match than I am because we will have Mustafi back, hopefully. Holding, we're not going to play as bad as we did against Leicester. There's no way that's going to happen because we were pretty piss poor. Um, so I'm I'm positive that we're going to go into this with a little bit more gusto. Um, what a way to start your season, though, Mike. You know, to come back and and score those two goals so late on. But um, I think that we play Stoke better, and um, I think it's going to be a completely different match. 
we're going to have just 90% possession for the most of it. So I, I'm confident we're going to go in and, and right the wrongs. My, my issue with Stoke, they are going to go in tough, which, okay, fair enough. But if they start crossing that ball in our six-yard box and we've got Nacho and Kalashnik back there, that's where it makes me nervous. So if we get back some more defensive partnerships that are actually out-and-out center backs, then I'm not, I think we'll be fine. Yeah, and, and I mean, we will have that. It's just it, if it takes until October and we've dropped 10 points by that point or more, then that's going to be a problem. So um, well, we, will, we will post uh, another podcast after the, the Stoke game next week. Um, we will likely have a guest. It will be one of a couple people, and you'll know before we do the podcast who that will be. Um, new countries. Uh, we have our 92nd country that, that's tuned into us. And, you know, I, I, I spend a lot of time on this, probably 5 to 12 hours a week uh, on the new countries. And um, country 92 is Malta. And I have to admit to you, you got nothing for Malta. I, I, I'm stumped. I, I'm absolutely stumped. I, no one in, in, in that relates to Arsenal, no one that relates to football. I mean, I, I could have rattled off some of the Maltese national players. I can think of as maybe Maltesers. The the, the the snack uh, has, has started listening to our podcast, which just which just literally occurred to me this second. But I mean, I I, I, c- I couldn't even come up with a name of anyone that that anyone would recognize. Um, so yeah, let's let's say that Maltesers, the the company and the the actual snack, has started listening to the podcast. But we always love a new country. We love new listeners, and I have heard from a lot of them on on Twitter. The the podcast, the the, the word is getting out. We're growing. The numbers are going up. Um, we talk to us if you're that person from Maltese, by the way. Oh, please. If you're the Malteser, uh, don't tease us and, 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 and tweet Malt us. us. <laughs> so, uh, us. yeah, please Malt please us. keep helping us spread the word. Listen on iTunes. Subscribe on on, uh, on YouTube. Still starting to get those numbers up on YouTube. But, if you know, if you look at those numbers on YouTube and think that those are the only people listening to the podcast, then you're starting to believe our jokes. But, no, that's – that's uh, <laughs> we'd like to get those numbers up, but – we, we tend to mostly still be a, an iTunes uh, cast, but please subscribe, leave comments, interact on Twitter, retweet our stuff if you can, and uh, it's going to be a fun, fun season. Uh, even if it's not a fun, fun season, <laughs> we're going to make it fun. So um, hope you have a good week, Andy. Thank you. You as well. Thanks, Jake, thanks for, for coming on, man. Yeah, thanks, Jake, for coming. No problem. And uh, come on, you Gooners. <laughs>